Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if personality has some sort of relationship with pathogen disgust. So does personality influence how sensitive someone is to the emotion of disgust? If it does, does that mean certain personality profiles are associated with a decreased risk of infection. So like tying this over to the coronavirus pandemic, what personality traits promote prevention? So avoiding disease carriers is thought to be adaptive. We know that illnesses can be transmitted through physical contact and many illnesses can be transmitted just from proximity. So from other people sneezing, coughing, talking, and even breathing. Coronavirus can be transmitted in both of these ways, so contact and being close to someone who is infected. Keeping one's distance from people who could be infected is referred to as the behavioral immune system. It features a number of detection and avoidance aspects, so the system includes more than just an emotional experience of disgust. It also involves the activation of aversive thoughts into one's working memory and the activation of decision-making strategies and movements that minimize infection risk. It's thought that, conceptually speaking, the behavioral immune system is really the same thing as pathogen disgust, which kind of captures the idea that an emotion is more than just something that combines with a belief to create a feeling, but rather there is a behavioral component to emotions as well. Emotions facilitate behavioral responses. Now, of course, pathogen disgust and personality are what this video is about, but I want to review quickly the other types of disgust, because pathogen disgust is only one type. Some of the other types do overlap a bit with pathogen disgust, but they are still classified as distinct. So I'll review the types of disgust and then list two items with each type that would cause the emotion of disgust in somebody who is high in that particular type of disgust. So starting here with moral disgust, a few examples, forging someone's signature on a legal document or shoplifting a candy bar from a convenience store. Then we have food related disgust. So eating organ meat or eating raw fish. There's death related disgust, touching a dead body or touching a skull. There's sexual disgust. So hearing strangers having sex or having sex with somebody who was just met. And of course, pathogen disgust. So a person with dirty fingernails gives you a book or shaking hands with an individual who has sweaty palms. So now to build on the idea of pathogen disgust by looking at personal space. The idea of personal space is related to pathogen disgust. Keeping a safe distance from somebody who could be infected or from any source of a contaminant is a key to staying safe. The theory here would be that pathogen disgust sensitivity would lead to the desire to maintain more personal space. So a higher level of disgust sensitivity means more personal space. That's fairly straightforward. Now disgust sensitivity comes at a cost. If someone maintains a lot of personal space, then they will deprive themselves of potential social interaction benefits. We also find that even with high disgust sensitivity, Somebody may fail to maintain personal space with a person who is infected if they depend on that person or they anticipate some sort of social benefit from them. When somebody is evaluating another who is infected, there is a risk reward analysis. What is the risk of being physically close to that person? And what is the reward of being close? With somebody who's infected, the theory here is that some people may have both high disgust sensitivity and a personality trait like high agreeableness, and these two traits fight against one another, right? So one trait pushes somebody away from that person who's infected, and the other trait pulls them in. When these opposing factors are calculated together, this leaves us to what's referred to as experienced disgust. It's an integration of all the costs and benefits, and it actually applies to both human beings and objects. So the way people feel about humans and the way they feel about objects. A human example, if somebody is evaluating the risk of infection from having sexual contact with another person, the characteristics of that other person may outweigh the risk. For example, if the other person is highly attractive or if they seem trustworthy. An example of an object, 
If somebody's looking at an apple that has a color, texture, and an odor that indicates some level of decay, that apple will appear to be less disgusting if somebody's really hungry. So here's why it's important to think about both people and objects when we think about this decision-making process. This is the key way that we can figure out the role of any personality trait related to human interaction. For example, agreeableness will factor into the decision to be close to another human being, but it won't factor into a decision to approach an object. If somebody's highly trusting, a facet of agreeableness, they may be more likely to be intimate with the potential mate, but they would not be more likely to eat the apple. So we have to look at pathogen disgust at these two levels, human and non-human, to figure out the relationship with personality. So let's take a look at this relationship. To look at this, I'll be using the five-factor model of personality. I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Each of the five factors has six facets. So there are 30 facets altogether. So starting with the first trait, this is openness to experience. Here we see all six of the facets of openness are negatively correlated with pathogen disgust to humans and to a lesser extent negatively correlated with non-human pathogen disgust. This means that people who are high in openness tend to experience less pathogen disgust. Therefore, people with high openness are more at risk. High openness is usually considered socially desirable but it is not desirable when it comes to avoiding pathogens. The next trait is conscientiousness. This is actually largely unrelated to both types of pathogen disgust, human and non-human. It's slightly protective, but it's really a small effect. So high conscientiousness is typically thought of as socially desirable. However, again, conscientiousness seems to have little to do with pathogen disgust. This is actually pretty surprising. Moving to extroversion. This one is usually thought of as being tied to approaching people. So we would tend to think of this as being associated with less pathogen disgust. Interestingly though, only two facets seem to be negatively associated with human pathogen disgust, warmth and positive emotions. The rest of the facets are not associated and none of the facets are associated with non-human pathogen disgust. High levels of extroversion are considered to be socially desirable, however, Friendly, happy extroverts are really at more risk. I would have thought that excitement seeking and gregariousness would also put someone at risk, but that's not what we see in the findings I'm talking about here. Agreeableness is the next trait. In terms of human pathogen disgust, three facets have been statistically significantly negatively correlated. Trust, compliance, and tender-mindedness. The other three facets of agreeableness, straightforwardness, altruism, and modesty, are unrelated. None of the facets are associated with non-human pathogen disgust. Now, usually high agreeableness is considered socially desirable, but high agreeableness may not be good for avoiding pathogens. The last trait is neuroticism. Here we really don't see much of a difference between human and non-human pathogen disgust. Impulsiveness and vulnerability are positively correlated with both types of disgust sensitivity. Anxiety is positively correlated with non-human disgust sensitivity. Interestingly, low neuroticism is usually considered to be more socially desirable, but here we see that high neuroticism is actually protective against pathogens. So what does this tell us about personality and physical distance between sources of infection? Well, outside of conscientiousness, which doesn't seem to play a large part, the least socially desirable profile is the most protective against infectious disease. So low openness to experience, low extroversion, low agreeableness, and high neuroticism. Now, I was trying to think about this profile and determine what lined up with this, what constructs seem to match this particular profile. And of course, it is related to vulnerable narcissism, a type of narcissism characterized by insecurity, resentfulness, distrust, and shame. So sometimes people wonder what the benefits are of being a vulnerable narcissist. Well, there it is. During a pandemic, this typically undesirable personality profile seems to be built to survive. Or is it? Right? So if we think about this further, we may come up with a different result. A socially desirable profile may lead to better compliance with precautions. For example, 
hand washing and avoiding groups. And that may outweigh all the benefits of pathogen disgust sensitivity. The question here becomes, wouldn't pathogen disgust also lead to that? Wouldn't it also lead to high levels of compliance? Well, the answer is no. With pathogen disgust, the person that's being evaluated, the one that would potentially be the source of a pathogen, they would have to be manifesting some indication of the pathogen to trigger the disgust in somebody else. Even a person with high pathogen disgust sensitivity will not react if there is no indication of infection or contamination. So an individual with a socially desirable personality profile would actually take more precautions. Now, if we mix conscientiousness back into that group, then we see a really significant impact because people who are conscientious do tend to be more aware of the rules and how those rules can impart benefits, right? So they're orderly. They like things to be arranged in a certain way and they want maximum productivity opportunities and becoming sick would not give them those opportunities. So I think that actually aligns the socially desirable personality profile much more strongly with staying safe during a pandemic. Now we do know with this particular pandemic, COVID-19, coronavirus, it's believed that many people who are contagious do not have symptoms. In a pandemic where everybody with the infection had some sort of symptoms that were visible, the socially undesirable personality profile would impart a larger benefit right? Because you would see that pathogen disgust more activated. But in the current pandemic, I would think the socially desirable profile is better aligned with prevention. Now, I know whenever I talk about topics like pathogen disgust, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.